Fiber to the home. Uh, Ivan Seidenberg in Keller, Texas in 2004 in Huntington Beach, California and in uh, T Tampa, Florida said we're going to test out a new concept of fiber to the home. Fort Wayne is the hub for the Midwest for GTE. Verizon bought GTE so like any good mayor what did I do? I invited the CEO of the new owner to come to town so we wouldn't lose the 3,000 jobs we had that GTE had in Fort Wayne. Rolled out the red carpet, uh, showed him how we were reducing the permitting time to get business done in Fort Wayne from 50 days down to less than 10. Everything you did in line, we're doing online. Potholes filled in four hours instead of four days. And I got all of his customers together in one room. All the hospitals, everybody that bought services from GTE. And I said, as we were giving the toast and talking to him afterwards, we've been hearing about this great innovation called fiber to the home. We don't want Fort Wayne to be last, we want to be the first in the Midwest. So in 05, they built out, creating 900 new jobs, fiber to the home, passing 132,000 homes and businesses. We're the only Midwestern build to get the fiber to the home. They're selling that whole system off to Frontier. And so Fort Wayne has been able to use high-speed broadband to support what our libraries are doing and other not-for-profit organizations. So what we promised was we said, look, in addition to making this the fastest, the best, the safest build, we will also create an innovators forum, we will create a seed capital fund to invest in new broadband applications, and we will create innovation teams, I-teams for broadband. Working with the library and with others, these are many of the I-teams that we created. I'm going to give you a glimpse of just a few of them to show how libraries can be partners in using the broadband that you're going to be working to get to radically improve the services to those who are underserved in your communities. And by the way, some of you are sitting here and saying, our town is less than 10,000 people. We can't do this. In Indiana today, there are 40 fiber-to-the-home communities all of them are in populations less than 20,000 and most in less than 10,000 and they're beginning to do these. And they came up with ways to get that fiber build in their community. So let me just talk about a couple of these innovation teams. Here's one that I love. We have this Matthew 25 clinic which was started by a group of faith-based individuals. It's the only clinic I'm aware of in our community, that in, in, in our region, that is free medical and dental services. No government funding. And so with this healthcare clinic, we said, well, what if all the healthcare clinics and all the emergency rooms where people came who had no health insurance? What if we could have an electronic medical record? What if we could connect all these clinics? In 2005, we stood up a system with 90,000 electronic medical records. And in this clinic, we used an example of broadband connectivity to help people with type 2 diag diagnosis for for diabetics. And what we said was, well, we could take this retinal camera, train the medical professionals that are there on a volunteer pro bono basis, take a retinal digital examination with broadband connectivity. We send it to one of our seven retinal surgeons on a pro bono basis between their surgeries. They give us reads. And the last time I was there to talk about it, we'd had two blindness saves within the last 60 days of people who didn't realize they had retinitis. And now when they go to emergency room, all that's queued up. And you know what they're doing? Those same folks are coming to our branch libraries and to the downtown library, and they're getting online, and they are looking at their own electronic medical records. They're getting a mentoring online, healthcare mentoring. We model it after a Stanford University hospital system of online mentoring for individuals who have diabetic uh, uh, concerns. So what we're trying to do is to take not-for-profit organizations. Here's one, the League for the Blind. Many libraries are already doing this, where you're welcoming individuals with disabling conditions to come in and use your resources. 19% of the population have a disabling condition. And the baby boomers are going to continue to make that number go up on a percentage basis, particularly for hearing impaired and sight impaired. This is a case where at the League for the Blind and Disabled, we put a video bridge in. We used high-speed broadband connectivity, and we were able to show that we could connect with an um, individual who was hard of hearing, with a person who could sign in Indianapolis, who was in a, calling a Utah call center to get their computer fixed. But obviously, if you can't hear, you can't use the 800 numbers. 
And so these are the ways that we were helping the hearing impaired. This now has can, can uh, spread to other uh, agencies and collaborative efforts, and we're now looking at libraries as being places where folks, if they can't afford this technology of high-speed broadband in their home, that they could come to the library and use that. Here's a great one, Senior Connect. We had high school students who would get computers from businesses, GE and Raytheon and ITT, and they would give them to the uh, community college, we'd refurbish the computers, we'd put them in community centers where there were seniors. The Pew study shows, as we've heard, that one of the lower cohorts of adopting of broadband are individuals 65 years of age and older. It's fast growing, but we still have low levels of utilization of broadband. So the high school students teach the seniors. The senior citizens then come to the library more able and more effective at to be able to use the resources that we have for them at the library. Fast, agile, smart city government and libraries. Every city I know is challenged by budget constraints. I know everybody says, we can't do it because we don't have the money. Where there's a will, there's a way, and we can do it if we all work at building these collaborative uh, uh, activities. I'm going to show an example of a collaborative activity. We heard discussion in the panel discussion about Houston and Ike and the challenges that you have and how libraries, particularly with broadband connectivity, can be so critical to what happens in a community. What if, there, what if there's an H1N1 or an avian flu outbreak and you have to have a snow day in the summer? In Indiana, we know what snow days are. Maybe some of you are, that, that analogy doesn't work. But uh, whether you're in Fort Worth or Fort Wayne, we are vulnerable. And so every mayor, knows what Ray Nagin felt in Katrina and Rita, where eventually, you know the story, he communicated with the President of the United States because somebody remembered they had a battery left after they were in their third location up in the Hyatt to connect with a VOIP on a laptop. 48 hours in the darkness. So what we've done is to think about collaboration among libraries and all of our other assets, including our community colleges. And so what we did was to take an old abandoned shopping area, 100 acres, fallen down, million square feet. Uh, the city intervened. We used our redevelopment authority. We acquired the property. And we built a state-of-the-art regional public safety training academy, which, by the way, could have a library. There's a library within about a half a mile from this. But in this, in this facility, we have five colleges and universities that have come together, and we're doing training and learning and broadband-based sharing for 5,000 first responders of the kind of training that will assist them to be ready for any hometown security emergency. Let me go uh, back to that slide. Okay. Mayors get this prerogative. Is there anybody in the room who's an elected official or has been elected official? Can anybody? Stand up, please. Just stand up. Anybody that's elected official or has been? Okay. I want everybody else to give them a round of applause. Stay standing. Okay. Now I want everybody else to stand up. This is the participatory part. Come on. Push your chairs back. Everybody's had a great meal. All right. Now I want you to remember this convene, connect, collaborate. So I'm going to ask you to do, this is a little drill we do when some of my staff people get a little, you know, tired and weary. It's called the cross crawl. It's very simple. You touch your left knee with your right hand and then you go the opposite direction. Come on, everybody, just this little exercise. Here's what you're doing. You're getting the connection between your right brain and your left brain. You're moving neurons through your corpus callosum or corpus callosum. This is how you get creative right brain, left brain activity. So everybody say this. Convene, connect, collaborate. Convene, connect, collaborate. Thank you very much. Give yourself a round of applause. All right. My wife always likes me to mention this last part. Neuroscience literature, in addition to what we learned today about the multiple intelligence learning theories, we also know a lot more about neural activity between the right brain and the left brain. For the women in the audience, as I said, my wife always likes me to say this, we know that there's three times more neural activity between the right brain and the left brain for those who are women. Men, we got our work to do. So men, you got to do that cross crawl more often to get that neural activity going. 